Greetings, fellow Earthlings, and welcome to the outside. Any of you who were watching last week will remember that we were looking at many interesting things inside the engine, the IMS specifically, and the main bearings as well. And many of you got back to me with some fantastic juicy information about all of those things, and I'm dying to tell you guys about it. But really, the reason we made these videos in the first place was supposed to be about some kind of IMS issue, but it turns out it wasn't. The reason that this car ended up being broken and the reason why I ended up making these videos about it turned out to be because of the Vario cam pads. While I have been referring to these little plastic doohickeys as the Vario cam pads, their official name is the Timing Chain Guide Rails. So the Timing Chain Guide Rails were the reason that this car started to run rough and the whole reason why we are making these videos. Due to their obvious significance to this project, I thought we might talk about them a little bit more today. How did we get our hands on these lovely little items? Well, in episode 14 and 15, we did venture into the cylinder heads and pull out the cams, and this tensioner and these cam pads come with it. Last week, we also shocked ourselves by making Porsche Special Tool 9632 out of parts that we bought off Amazon. I will put a link in the description for all of those bits and bobs if any of you would like to make your own Porsche Special Tool. This style of Vario cam was first introduced on the 1992 Porsche 968. Really, this is a basic system that is replaced by the Vario cam Plus in the 2002 models onward. So that's a Vario cam Bank 1. With a bit of struggling, we got it out. Now I do feel we're ready for the Vario cam Extravaganza! Okay, Vario Cam Bank 1 seems like a good place to start with. We know that this is Vario Cam Bank 1 because the part where the cable comes out is black. On Bank 2, it's grey. Now, to take off these cam pads, you just pop them off like a bottle cap. Very simple, no tools needed, just thumbs. And you can see that that upper cam pad is pretty well worn. Okay, popping off the lower cam pad now. That's the one that has that green O-ring. I don't know what kind of Sasquatch creature was in my garage, but look at that crazy hair. Never mind the crazy damage to the cam pad. Now there's the new set. They came from Pelican Parts. You can see that they are much nicer looking and a different color. My understanding is that the new ones, if you buy new ones now, they are a different material or a different design to the ones that came originally on the cars. All right, we're gonna to attempt to test the solenoid. Now really, the proper way to test the solenoid and the actuator in these cars is with the uh, Porsche Durametric tool when everything is still in the car. We're kind of past that point and I don't have one of them. So I'm attempting to do a DIY version of a test. I'm bringing in my multimeter here. I wanna test this Estes Rocket battery pack that I'm using to see what kind of battery power I have left in it. It's a nine volt, but it's kind of worn out. The reason for that is this is presumably a 12 volt system, but I don't know for a fact that it gets the whole 12 volts to do its work. And so I just wanna be careful and give it a minimal amount of voltage and amperage to just see if it does anything. You will notice that I've used a multitude of blue rubber bands holding in this piston that I'm thinking is gonna shoot out as soon as I take off that special tool. And that's courtesy of some advice I got on various forums. Now, it's ridiculous, don't bother. I'm gonna do this twice on bank two, I'm gonna do it again. And you'll see there kind of the way, closer to the way that I feel you should do it if you're less clueless than I am at this time. Online, I'm told it's supposed to make a clicky noise if you energize it. And so here it is, it does do a clicky noise. Hit the notification bell, it's up there. Yes, please. All right, next, we're gonna take off the solenoid with that T20 Torx bit. Very easy to do, really. And here, I fundamentally misunderstood how this whole system worked. 
I thought when you energize the solenoid that this longer rod would poke out and that itself was what was stretching the chains and changing the timing. But it's not. That little solenoid just pushes that little valve to a different position which allows pressurized oil to flow into the piston and stretch out the chains. You'll notice there, once I give the solenoid some power, it does make that pin pop out pretty readily every time. So I'm going to consider that good news. All right, time for a cleanup. Introducing Kimtech Delicate Task Wipers. I'd never heard of these before, but they don't put any lint behind. You're supposed to use them if you're cleaning the insides of engines. Very handy. Okay, we're taking off those pointless rubber bands. And you'll see that the worst thing that happens is it kind of comes out. Now that spring, that's what you're compressing. It has a little orange thing in there, which we'll talk about later. And that's the piston. I don't know if that other side is supposed to come out, but it doesn't seem to really want to, so I'm leaving it. All right, this was at one time a cake tin. Definitely isn't now though. This is gonna be the area that we're cleaning it. I'm using some goggles there because you can get this in your eye pretty easy. Ask me how I know. That is just brake cleaner. No particular brand. That one actually says parts cleaner on it. So just going through the items here, spraying off what I can, using those Kim wipes to clean it up uh, as much as I can also. Now to get into the cylinders there, I'm using toothpicks and toothpicks are very important to this job as will become apparent. All right, time to put it back together again. Everything is clean. Didn't seem to break anything, I think. Okay, that little orange thing, it's kind of like a bump stop and you want it that the writing is facing you as you put it in. That's how it was when I took it out. I'm just using regular 5W30 weight motor oil, synthetic motor oil, which is what this system runs on anyway. I figured that would be a good thing to use. And putting on our Porsche special tool again to recompress that really working towards putting it back into the car ultimately. Lefty tighty, still feels weird. Now that washer is a little big. That's gonna come into play later on, on uh, bank two. All right, here's the thing with the toothpick. So that spring has an area in the bottom, like in the center where it's supposed to line up. And so the toothpick lines that up, but then you see that little dot in that piston, that, can fit on the toothpick and then you can slide all of it down into the bottom and it fits nice. So then I'm just dumping the butt of that piston in the oil and putting it in. And then yes, that plastic spatula, if you wanted to name your petunias and remember where you put them, you would use one of those little stakes in the ground, but it's good for oil when you're fixing your Porsche. Right now, putting the solenoid back on top with that T20 Torx. A little fiddly, but not too bad, really. Now, when I was taking it off, there really wasn't much torque on it. And ultimately, it was like not even a quarter turn from finger tight, and that felt like good. Okay, next, we need to put the new timing chain guide rails back on. This one's called the upper. It's the plain one. It goes next to the solenoid, just clips on, very easy. The bottom one, the lower one, has that green O-ring and the two dots in it. And then that clips on very easy as well. Then I'm gonna compress down our special tool about as far as it seems to want to go. Right, another thing I'm gonna try to test is the resistance across the solenoid. I don't know what it should be. I'm certainly not an expert at this kind of stuff, but I have this multimeter, I thought I'd have a go. It's possible that my multimeter does not have enough decimal places to be able to tell the difference, but what we can say is there is continuity through the solenoid. The in is in touch with the out as far as the electrical part of it is concerned. Then that is ready to go back on the car, so I'm just gonna stick it in a Ziploc bag and it goes in a special place for everything that's ready to go back on the car. All right, we did bank one. Let's have a go at bank two. Welcome to the overhead shot. 
That little red box is actually the new timing chain that we're going to talk about later, not actually this week. Timing marks. All right, then, we know already that the two dots on the cam are supposed to line up with the two different colored links on the chain. And I marked with white out where they really are. Now, we know that these two different colored links on the chain, there are 15 links between them. So now I'm just going to count how many links there are between the two white out marks that I made originally. Count along if you like. Okay, there, there are 17 links right there. So that's two teeth that this chain managed to slip. Now we'll double check here. County, county. So I hope you guys all agree. 15 links. And so that is bad. That means that the bank two timing chain slipped two teeth. I bet it's because of the cam pads being really worn. Here's bank one now. Let's count between those white out marks. And yes, we find the magic number of 15 links. So that seems to suggest that bank one was in time. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like me to make more, the best way to tell me is to click that subscribe button. All right, let's disassemble bank two. Starting off with our homemade Porsche special tool 9632. Lefty tighty is the trick. What we're doing here then is there's the spring inside now that we know. We're just compressing that, which is going to allow us to get enough slack in the chain to remove the actuator and get at the pads. It's pretty awkward. This pad is just, it just fell off right there. It's so damaged. Kind of helped get the actuator out. Now here I'm putting two zip ties through bank two and one zip tie through bank one. And just to help me not mix them up, because I'm afraid that that might happen. Look at this sorry state. It is just ruined. It's split through and is missing a piece, of course. And that was chomped up by the engine. And we found it in the oil sump and in the oil filter. The other one's not much better. Bringing in the new ones here that look so much nicer. Now they do look obviously a very different color. Apparently it's a different material of some sort, some sort of a redesign. I do know that the coating that's on them is quite resilient and lasts for quite some time. But that after the initial coating is worn, the deterioration is accelerated. You'll notice that this solenoid has a gray end on it. You can see that when this is all mounted on in the car. Now for all of these things, I might not always show it, but Back to Black is my go-to product for these kind of rubber or plastic things. It can make it look and feel new. So here I am, I'm trying to do that ohm testing thing again to see what the resistance is. And really continuity is about the best I can hope for. Um, maybe there just really isn't much resistance in there at all. Certainly uh, this multimeter may not be sensitive enough to test for that. And I might be doing it wrong, let's be honest. Now then, I'm just seeing what kind of voltage I'm getting out of that 9 volt battery. And shockingly now, that same battery is giving over 9 volts. This now is the solenoid for bank 2. We're just going to see if it does anything when you give it power. And it does. It pops out. Now, if this truly does take the full 12 volts and however many amps, 40 odd amps that a battery can put out in a car, maybe that does do much more. Maybe it pokes out more. Okay, here that's our cake tin of death, some paper towel, parts cleaner, brake cleaner, doesn't seem to matter. Taking off the special tool now, we don't need it. Removing that piston valve, I'm not sure if that's what you'd call it. And then the spring and the little bump stop thing. Liberal doses of cleaner. I do have the vent fan on in the tiny garage. This stuff, like I've said before, it's not the kind of high you want. So inside that piston, just trying to clean up all the dirt, anywhere I can get those Kimtech wipes and perhaps even a toothpick. I'm using that to just clean up all the grime. I'm not really doing anything magical, just trying to get it back to zero and then re-lube it. That's the whole thing. The toothpick is really very handy to get inside these areas. I'm using a toothpick because the wood is going to have a hard time scratching any of the metal.
Right, here we go with our gardening sign supplies. On that piston, really no magic to it. I'm just trying to lube up anything I can with that regular motor oil, which is what it's going to be using to run the system anyway. Spring in there. The spring can go either way. It doesn't seem to have a front or a back. And then the bump stop with the writing towards you. Probably doesn't matter, but that's how it was. And this is the piston that at least I'm able to remove. Lubing it up there, it's nice and clean. And once they're back together, we can put our special tool 9632 back in. Still trying to get used to the lefty tighty, it just feels weird. Now watch there how that washer is now hanging down on that side. That's gonna be important later. Really just a smaller washer would be better. But I was limited on my washer supply. I've got billions of the wrong size. All right, this little trick here with the, another toothpick. I'm sure there's probably some sort of fancy way of doing it, but the toothpick thing just seems to work. All right, so dip in that piston's butt in the oil there. I'm just going for complete coverage. All right, ready for insertion. We've got the toothpick coming in the bottom. We feed the spring onto that then get the tip of the toothpick onto the little indent in that piston and then slide them all down as a group. And then it just kind of feels good, feels right. Like I know. Cleaning off um, the excessive oil and then bolting that guy back on again with those T20 Torx bolts, these little tiny little Torx screws that go in the top. Time to put our timing chain guide rails back on. That one is the plain one. No dots, no o-ring. It goes by the solenoid and it's called the upper, but I can't get it on because of the aforementioned washer issue. So a slight righty loosey fix that. I clipped the upper one on okay, but did you catch the mistake? I didn't, not when I was doing any of the work. I ended up watching the video quite a few times and realizing that something wasn't quite right. Yes, the cam pads or the timing chain guide rails for bank two were switched. The upper was where the lower was and the lower was where the upper should be. I don't know if that is the reason why the lower on bank two was worn so terribly bad and ended up falling apart, but maybe that's a contributing factor. I don't know what difference it would make if you swapped the upper with the lower, but that's interesting. So it was out of time because of so much damage and possibly it was damaged so badly because it was in the wrong place. What do you folks think? You've seen the same evidence as I have. What do you think happened? So here we are putting the lower cam pad on with the little O-ring that goes on the inside. And that's the one that has the two dots. And that just clips on, again, like a little bottle cap, very easy. The simplest part of the whole thing. And the fact that those items cost $21 per side. So the reason that this entire Porsche died was for $45, maybe $55 with shipping. In conclusion then, this fine German engineered Porsche beast was struck down by $50 worth of plastic. As we all know, the problem with these parts is not the fact that they cost $50. It's the fact that it's going to cost you thousands of dollars to pay someone who knows what they're doing to go in there and replace them. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Till next time. <laughs>